Sometimes while researching some other cases I'm working on, I come across some really crazy stories that aren't really long enough to be their own video, but I can't just ignore. So every once in a while I compile them all into one big video. This is one of those. So sit back and enjoy all these crazy cases I've come across lately. Before we move on, I'd like to give a shout out to PDS Debt for sponsoring this episode. I know that a lot of you out there are just like me, wishing that there was a better way to pay off debt. Maybe you're struggling with credit card debt, uh, personal loans, debt collection agencies, even medical bills. It's no secret that inflation just keeps going up and gas prices don't really seem to be getting better either. So now would probably be the time to start thinking about how to pay off that debt more efficiently. If you're making payments on your debt every single month and your balance doesn't really seem to be going down, then this is for you. PDS Debt is giving viewers of this channel a free debt savings analysis. All you have to do is complete their 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. You'll get a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and figure out the quickest way to take care of your debt. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. Everyone with over $10,000 in debt qualifies, and the cool thing is there's no minimum credit score required. Fair and even bad credit is also accepted. You can end up saving thousands in interest and fees, and not to mention pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. Like I said, PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to my listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. That's pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. So take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash diretrip. And now, back to the content. Alright, so first off we have Oklahoma man allegedly killed fishing partner over Bigfoot fears. A man named Larry Sanders, age 52, was out noodling near Ada, Oklahoma on July 9th with his friend named Jimmy Knighton. Noodling is apparently a kind of fishing that is performed with your hands. It reminds me of that episode of King of the Hill where they did what I think they called cat fistin'. Either way, this noodling session ended up with Larry beating and strangling Jimmy to death. So what happened? Good question. Well, we do know that Larry and Jimmy got into a physical altercation while they were out in the river. Larry ended up striking Jimmy during this altercation and ultimately strangling him. Jimmy died there on the scene and Larry decided to go turn himself into the police. When he did, he actually confessed that a relative of his had killed Jimmy, though. He soon changed his story and told the truth, though that he killed Jimmy because he had summoned Bigfoot to come and kill him. Jimmy's body was found by the police investigators the next day. Although Larry has confessed to the strangling, they're still going to perform an autopsy. The police definitely assumed that he was under the influence of some kind of substance during the altercation, but they're not really sure what. Larry continued to ramble on about Bigfoot as they tried to interrogate him. Larry was soon charged with first-degree murder in relation to Jimmy's death. Given that he hasn't really proven to be the most sane witness, they're still going to carry out a full investigation into exactly what went down that night. It always makes it easier, said one of the investigators, but added that you still have to prove all the elements of the crime and that what the suspect is telling you is actually what happened. Larry Sanders is being held at the Pontecock County Detention Facility for the time being. It doesn't seem he has a court date, and it isn't clear if he even has an attorney to represent him yet. I guess we'll see what happens here. So the next story I have here. Bronx student who fatally stabbed classmate gets 14 years in prison. So there was a young man out in the Bronx in New York City who, after being bullied and pestered for being gay for his entire life, lashed out one day and completely exploded. Or at least that's what it seemed at first, but then the story got pretty controversial. So back in September of 2017, we had a young man named Abel Sedeno who was getting ready for school one day. He put on a pink t-shirt, grabbed his books and his inhaler, and put them into his bag, along with one extra item a switchblade that he had bought online a few weeks prior. He then set out to go attend class at the Urban Assembly School for Wildlife Conservation. Now here, things get a bit blurry, but this is what is said to have happened. So, Abel had bullies at school, bullies who tended to come after him for being gay. It goes without saying that he had reached his limit with them after quite some time. It's said that, on this day, someone either threw a pencil or a paper ball in his direction and caused him to explode in anger. 
A bull, 18 years old at this point, hopped up and stabbed 15-year-old Matthew McCree, who is said to have bullied him for years, in the chest with the switchblade he had brought to school. Then, despite claiming that this was all self-defense, he stabbed a 16-year-old boy named Ariana LeBoy five times when he tried to intervene. Needless to say, Abel was arrested and taken in, and things quickly became very divisive. So as we heard, Abel claims that he did this after snapping due to all the bullying. However, the victim's mother has said that the school system had been warned about him at least three years in advance, specifically that he often carried knives and that he had pulled them on his own family in the past. A memo later leaked showing that, indeed, the Department of Education had been told about this and had done nothing. This is only made worse by the fact that Abel admittedly bought the switchblade a few weeks prior before deciding to bring it to school that day. Not only that, but even by his own admission, he wasn't being physically threatened at the time of the incident. However, a lot of people who have been bullied still sympathize with his actions, saying that anyone would snap after undergoing such treatment for such a long period of time. The judge, Michael Gross, didn't argue that Abel had endured a significant amount of torment. Abel apologized for what he did, what he called the damage, and called himself a monster. Everything that happened that day was almost two years ago. I'm not the same person as I was two years ago, he said. However, the judge still handed down a 14-year sentence to the now 20-year-old man. The victim's aunt said, Seeing what Abel did to my nephew made me lose faith in everything I believed in. The mother of the boy who was stabbed after intervening said that her son lost his best friend, his childhood, and his joyful nature that day. The victim's mother let out a loud scream as that was said and had to excuse herself from the courtroom. Many felt that Abel's apology wasn't really sincere. That wasn't an apology, because an attorney was telling him what to say, said the victim's mother. Although the length of the sentence wasn't really ideal, she said she was okay with it. The prosecutors had aimed for about 30 years, but they got less than half of that. He will have to undergo five years of supervision after the sentence as well. His lawyer, Christopher Lynn, has said that his client's sentence is excessive and that he plans to appeal it. Again, I guess we'll see. Next up, we have, they didn't thank him for holding the door, so he pulled a gun. A man in New Haven, Connecticut is in police custody after a recent ordeal in which he decided to take door-holding etiquette very, very seriously. A 25-year-old guy named Joshua Murray was at a family dollar store out in New Haven, Connecticut just recently when he decided that he would be a gentleman and hold the door open for two women who were entering the store. Much to his dismay, they didn't thank him. The absolute scumbags entered without even saying a word. This was when Joshua got extremely angry. A witness said that he got angry, started ranting, and eventually flew into a complete rage when he then pulled a gun on the two women. Once he realized that he had likely just made a giant scene, he fled the scene of the crime. It didn't take too long for officers to find him nearby, though. When they found him, though, he didn't have his gun anymore. It seemed that he had ditched it somewhere. It is said that he resisted the arrest to some degree. Eventually, he was detained and was charged with one felony count of carrying a pistol without a permit. He got some misdemeanor charges for interfering with the arrest as well, and two counts of second-degree breach of peace, too. He's being held on a $25,000 bail. I mean, in the end, at least nobody was hurt during the entire ordeal, and learn to say thank you. Goddamn. Alright, so next we have, Man allegedly steals a cop car, then responds to call. Now, my notes for this case are in a file that I call GTA, and you'll see why. Most people out there would consider it pretty outlandish to ever think of stealing a cop car. Well, how about stealing a cop car and then responding to calls? A drunk, knife-wielding ruffian out in Colorado decided to do just that. Jeremiah James Taylor, a 33-year-old man who was already on probation for theft, a DUI charge, and menacing, broke into a police substation out in Park County and decided to steal a squad car in the early hours one Monday morning, roughly at about 3 a.m. As to why he decided this would be a good idea, we don't really know. But who else is placing their bets on meth? About 30 minutes after stealing the car, a domestic violence call came in over the radio. For some further bizarre, unknown reasoning, Jeremiah decided to answer that call. He drove to the nearby Teller County where the call took place. The people who called the police noted that this supposed officer seemed intoxicated and had damaged the police car prior to pulling up. 
being that he actually ended up being the first responder, the people at the house complained to the dispatcher that the officer they were sent seemed drunk. He had reportedly jumped out of the car and yelled, where's the old man that's going to shoot someone? Confusing everyone at the scene. Another local deputy pulled up, the one who was originally intended to show up anyway, and confronted Jeremiah, who then got back into the car and peeled out toward a nearby highway. The real police finally spotted him again about two hours later, and that led to a high-speed chase, going about 110 miles per hour on a road with many other civilian vehicles. Needless to say, this resulted in a good number of traffic violations to pile on to the oncoming charges against him. He then crashed the patrol car on the side of the road and ran out into the woods. Once the police cornered him, they tasered him, which didn't work. To their surprise, Jeremiah then pulled out a small knife and made several injuries to himself. He was then taken to the hospital for treatment. There at the hospital, he was arrested for a load of charges. These included impersonating a police officer, grand theft auto, resisting arrest, reckless endangerment, and reckless driving. Upon being released from the hospital, he was transferred to the county jail. He also became the prime suspect in a load of crimes that took place in that vicinity just a couple of hours prior. He's currently being held on a $12,000 bond. Alright, so next I actually get to mention Missouri again. Missouri man fatally shot in lawn mowing dispute. So a Missouri man is accused of shooting and killing his neighbor over a dispute involving mowing the lawn. Authorities say that the animosity between these two had gone on for years by this point. So a man named Samuel Avery, a 42-year-old man from Kansas City, was charged on Monday with second-degree premeditated murder in the murder of Warner Trotter, a 41-year-old man. Samuel shot Warner in the head on his front porch, said the authorities. He was pronounced dead at the hospital later. According to court documents, Avery called the police on Sunday to report that he had shot his neighbor. Officers found Avery on the adjacent balcony and took him into custody without incident. It seems that right now, Samuel does not have an attorney to represent him. Police said that they had actually been called out to the two men's homes twice before after other arguments involving mowing the lawn too early in the morning. At those times, nobody was arrested. According to neighbors, those two had argued for over 10 years about lawn mowing disputes. It seems that, on the day of the fatal shooting, Trotter complained that Avery's mower was making too much noise and he made a hand gesture that he was going to shoot Avery. Avery said he called the police and was told that they weren't going to do anything about it. Then Trotter waved around a real gun, sending a message. Hours later, Trotter and a woman returned home with food from a restaurant. The woman told police that she was inside the house when she heard Trotter asking Avery something like, Do you have something to say to me? Then she heard several shots. According to court documents, he told the police that he had emptied his entire clip in Trotter. Police then arrived and arrested Samuel Avery without incident. Surveillance video from the home showed that Trotter did not reach for his rifle at any time, meaning that the case couldn't be self-defense. Avery had said that he started shooting because Trotter reached for his gun, but the video showed that that just simply wasn't the case. And boy, I must say, this is a Missouri case if I've ever seen one. And now we have teen charged on suspicion of killing alleged pedophile priest by ramming crucifix down his throat. Okay, so I'll admit, I didn't think this case was real upon my first reading, but after further research, it is. Here we have a story that took place in France, the story of a boy who was only identified as Alexandre V in the media due to being a minor. Alex allegedly attacked his Catholic priest, a 91-year-old man, by shoving a crucifix down his throat and killing him in his home. Now, admittedly, that sounds horrible, but let's get into the backstory here. After Alex was arrested, his lawyer wanted to get to the bottom of things. While interviewing Alex and his family, he uncovered quite a horrific history between the family and the priest. Not only Alex, but his father had also been subjected to perverse acts of this priest in the past. The old man had victimized both of them throughout his long tenure as priest. We know now that the suspect's father was a victim of the priest, said the lawyer. We also know that this person tried to protect his children, and then, after his divorce, he fell back into the clutches of Matasoli. Matasoli being the name of this priest. The things that Alex and his father endured were nothing short of disgusting, and I think I'll leave that up to your imagination. Alexandra mentioned facts that were likely to have disturbed him deeply. 
There was talk of Alex cleaning the house naked for the priest, added the lawyer. It turns out that Alex and his father weren't even the first men to accuse priest Matasoli of abuse. The family said that the accusations were actually widely known, and rumors of his abuse dated all the way back to the 1960s. Some people say that the only reason he was even transferred to this particular church was because of his obscene acts back at his original parish in the 60s, especially after rumors that the priest was showering with boys at the church. One other family at the church, after finding out about a prolonged eight years of abuse against their son, decided to press charges, only to find out that they were past the statute of limitations. The sister of that victim said, The priest denied all allegations outright. He told my brother that his sensitivity caused him to tell lies. Shortly before the priest's death, he was actually being investigated due to all the allegations against him. However, no report was ever sent to Rome, and the case was dropped upon his death. Alexandra claims that he doesn't have any memory of the murder. Police attempted to question him, but he is being hospitalized for what they call severe mental problems. Alright, so now we have Subway worker allegedly shot, killed, over too much mayonnaise on customer sandwich. Just recently, one Sunday night at 6.30pm, there was a Subway store on Northside Drive in Atlanta, Georgia that ended up being a scene of carnage. A customer, a 36-year-old man, came into the store very unhappy with how his sandwich had been prepared. He was particularly unsatisfied with the amount of mayonnaise they had put on it, to be exact. To quote the owner of the store, We had a customer that came in that was a little upset about how his sandwich was fixed, the owner said. Believe it or not, it was over too much mayonnaise on his sandwich. The suspect came inside the restaurant, ordered a sandwich, and there was something wrong with the sandwich that made him so upset that he decided to take out his anger on two of the employees here. This particular customer was one that the owner recognized. He was a customer who had been to the store on numerous other occasions before and never had an issue. After arguing with the staff on deck, a 26-year-old woman and a 24-year-old woman, the man started to get enraged. It isn't known what sent him so far over the edge, but it got to the point where he pulled a gun and started shooting. This was when all hell broke loose and a store manager pulled their own gun, firing back. Atlanta, Georgia, folks. In the end, the 26-year-old employee was killed on the spot, and the 24-year-old employee was injured. The injured worker's 5-year-old child was at the location at the time of the incident, but was not injured. All of this, over some mayonnaise. Both of the employees were rushed to the hospital. There was nothing they could do for the employee who had already passed away, but the other was listed as being in critical condition. Thanks to a tip from someone in the area, the police were able to track down and arrest the suspect. The police said, yes, it's a sandwich, but more importantly, someone who failed to resolve a conflict by just walking away, who decided to take actions into his own hands, and now we have families who are devastated. The five-year-old who witnessed the whole ordeal is set to go into trauma counseling very soon. So now we have sentencing delayed again for vegan mom Sheila O'Leary who starved toddler to death. Sheila O'Leary, a 38-year-old woman, had a family that she forced to abide by a strict vegan diet, usually consisting of only fruits and vegetables. Due to this, she's now being hit with quite the list of criminal charges. She and her husband had three kids, ranging in age from 18 months to 5 years old. All of them were malnourished. She actually even had one more child at one point who was returned to their biological father after similar cases of malnourishment. By the time of today's incident, the family was eating only raw fruits and vegetables. The baby, however, was allowed to have breast milk. The baby's weight, however, was less than half of what it should have been at that stage in development, though, more closely resembling that of a seven-month-old. Eventually, the child passed away due to this malnutrition, and the couple was investigated and promptly arrested. This child did not eat. He was starved to death over 18 months, said the Special Victims Unit chief. Sheila was convicted in June on six different charges, those being first-degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter, child abuse, and two counts of child neglect. She is facing life in prison. However, her sentencing has since been delayed. Twice. The father of the baby, a man named Ryan Patrick O'Leary, is facing most of the same charges as his wife. Not only that, but after a thorough investigation, he's also facing charges of sexual assault and lewd acts towards a minor as well. It just keeps getting deeper. Sheila's lawyer keeps pushing for a new trial. He showed pictures of her with the kids to the courtroom, saying, 
Does that look like a mom who wants to kill her kid? Just because it happened doesn't mean she committed a crime. He asserts that this was all simply a tragic accident, and insists that a series of errors led to her conviction. Sheila says that she wants a new lawyer regardless, blaming him for not defending her in the way she wanted. Here's another one where we'll just have to see what happens. So once again, thank you for watching my video today. This was quite a list of weird crimes, the longest weird crimes list I've done so far. Let me know if you want to see more like this, I might make it a monthly thing. If you found the video interesting, please give it a like, it helps me out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you like stuff like this. Go ahead and add me on social media if you want as well, I mean, you know how YouTube is, if anything happened to the channel, that would be where you'd find out. If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I keep linked down in the description below as well. There you can see all my videos early and uncensored, so go ahead and give it a shot. Speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. JB Funk Raven Entrepreneur Grack Salad Kevin, AMCMT, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Marsh, Buffazerk, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Maine, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You are the pinnacle of humanity. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.